session, we're going to kind of keep it low and low key. Uh, Steve's going to talk a little bit. Since Steve spent a lot of his time as a scout, as a professional scout, I thought it would be valuable for him to talk to you about what professional scouts look for. And again, you guys, I've really, really enjoyed this. I, I hope that I've been, you know, inspired. I hope I've taught. Uh, Tom, thanks for having me out here. I want to do it again. Uh, I always thought I was going to be a coach. Like, I, I'm a dumbass other than baseball. Like, everybody's like, how do you spend 11 years in AAA? Well, I knew the friggin' alternative. <laughs> Getting a real job. Right? So I always thought I was going to be a coach. And then about going into my 12th year at AAA, one of my buddies, Louis Medina, who now is the assistant GM for the Kansas City Royals, got a job with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Before they had a, a big league team for two years, and he just got a scouting job in Arizona, and they were looking for a scout in Orange County, San Diego, where I live. So he called me up, and the first word out of his mouth was, "Dude, your playing career is killing your scouting career," and that sort of made sense to me. And I was a scout three days later, and I covered like, like uh, Orange County and San Diego. That was my job to figure out who could play. See, that's called an area scout, right? And that's what. Every club has about 20 area scouts. Like my whole job, my furthest drive was like an hour and a half. I had guys that had five states that were my buddies. And I'd drive down to San Diego and I'd call them up and I'm like, dude, my back's killing me. I just drove an hour and a half. And these guys just are like 12 hour drives just to get to a place, right? So as an area job, your job is to identify who you like, right? You guys, believe it or not, everybody in this room's a scout. If you're a coach or a player, you're a scout, right? You just haven't had to write it down because you know who can play on your team and you know who you can play on other team. And the, the, the best thing about it is everybody's got an opinion. And the first thing one of the, a, a really good scout told me in scouting, he said, remember what you say and remember what somebody else says. Because you're not going to find out if you're right for about five years, right? I could have the opinion. I could love this guy. And he doesn't pan out. Right? I, I remember we had a workout with the Diamondbacks because we were just filling our teams. We didn't have a big league team for two years. And so we were having tryouts all over the country. And we had a, a, a tryout at Golden West College in Huntington Beach. And we, got, we brought a catcher in there from Cerritos. Right? And this guy was a dumbass. I mean, he, he, he played two years at, a, at junior college. He could not get into any college, so he's bullpen catching for his junior college team. We bring him to the tryout. Right? In about his fifth swing, it starts piss raining in California, which never rains. And I'm telling you right now, in that fifth swing, he hit a freaking seven-second pop-up. And that means that you got a little bat speed, and we signed him. And that guy's name was Rod Barajas, who played 14 years in the big leagues. We signed him for $500. You would have thought I gave him a half a million. He was so happy to sign. And this is the beautiful thing about scouting, because there's no exact science to it. Right? This is why first rounders can't get out of A ball and guys not drafted spend 10, 14 years in the big leagues. Because there's no exact science to it. Right? So, you know, when, when we're looking for players, I mean I signed the first pick in the Arizona Diamondback history. Nick Beerbrock, a pitcher, left-handed pitcher. This guy had projection. He was loose. He weighed about 170 pounds. He had a frame where he should be 230 when it's all said and done, when he gets his man body. Never pitched in the big leagues. We gave him a million dollars. In the same draft, or the same year, we get Rob Morales 500. It's just that there's no exact science to the whole thing. So that's the area scout. Right? Spring, we got about 20 of them. Spring, would you talk a little bit about you, you used it. I scouted for 20 years, too. You talked about projecting and how, you, how a scout has to learn how to project. Can you maybe explain that a little bit to them? So you it's really the hardest thing to do in baseball, right? To tell you, to, I'm going to tell my boss that a 17-year-old kid is going to end up being a big league or an all-star. So what, what are we looking for in projection? We're looking for bodies, right? I mean, when you first go to a, to a field, and I might be going there, maybe I'm a cross-checker now, and I'm going to see my area guy who he likes, and I'm watching the whole game, right? But I'm going to do a body check. I'm going to see who has a pretty good physical body or who has a good projection of body at 17, 18 years old where I can actually visualize this guy putting on 20 pounds because he will, right? And it's, it's really hard to do, but it's not as hard as you think it would be because you got experiences. 
right? I played 11 years in AAA. You know what that gave me? That gave me the friggin' most unbelievable database, right? Like when I would go scout a guy, oh, this guy reminds me of Lenny Dice, oh, this guy reminds me of Jeff McKnight, who was a utility guy. And so everything's about comparison on who this guy reminds me of. That's just part of scouting, right? As a cross checker, I was a West Coast, after two years, they, they made me a West Coast cross checker. So now I had five area scouts, California, uh, the Northwest and Washington area, the Four Corners. Uh, shit, I don't even remember. But there was, there was five of them. Oh, we had one. We had because California's so big. We had two scouts in California, Southern California, and one in Northern California. So I would go and see who they liked, right? And this is the the thing that I learned really quick. If I knew my area scout was really good, and I saw the guy in a bad day, because I'm bouncing, I'm in a different place every single day. I could be on a, in Arizona one day, Washington to the next, right? And so now I'm like looking, I go see a guy and he walks twice and pops up. Write him up. <laughs> Write him up. How do you do that? It's hard to do because you want to see it, right? One of my biggest pet peeves in scouting is when we're in meetings and a scout will say, well, when I saw him, he struck out eight out of ten times. And I'm like, well, when you were there, you dumbass, he hit 25 home runs. So you got to put the whole picture into it. It's not just what you see, right? And if you think your area scout is really good and you didn't see it, I try to get back. And you know what? A lot of time the guy was right. I remember saw the pitcher. She had a pitcher from Texas. I'm blanking right now. But he went. He 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 didn't give me that warm fizzy. Because when I see a pitcher that's really good. I actually get a physical feeling in my stomach that I'm seeing something good, right? And I didn't see it off this guy. But my, my area guy loved him, and I thought he was a good scout. I went back about two starts later, and I stuffed him. I made him a first-round pick. Colby Lewis was the guy's name, right? So you got to know your personnel as a scout. you got to know, like, uh, an area scout, he scouts in, like, a fishbowl. The West Coast guy scouts in the lake. And the national guy, like if I like him, the national guy and the scouting director, they scout in the ocean. So they see the whole country. They see the whole you know, picture. And, and the biggest mistake that area guys will make, because they get close to the families, they gotta go in and do a house visit, they gotta find the guy's makeup, his personality, is an area scout telling this guy where he likes him and where he thinks he's gonna get picked. Because it's a friggin' big, big country, man. It is a big country, and, and there's only 30 first-round picks. And now i got an area guy telling this guy where he has them, where he likes them. So what does that do to the player? In his mind, he's thinking, oh, I'm going to be a first-round. And then all of a sudden, first round goes, and then the scout gets phone goes, what happened? <laughs> and all of a sudden, the second round goes, what happened? And now the, now the kid's pissed at the area scout because he thought he was going to be a first-round pick. So as a scout, you got to be really, really careful what you tell the player. And I would always say, hey, buddy, I, I'm not making the draft pick. I'm not the scouting director. The scouting director is responsible for who's picking. I remember we had, with the Arizona Diamondbacks, we brought three players into the draft or into a pre-draft workout. So we brought them in to work them out. Ryan Christensen, uh, Corey Myers, and Hank Blaylock, who played 10 years in the big leagues. I loved Hank Blaylock. He was the most comfortable hitter I've ever seen in a box. Right? I'm looking for friggin' somebody that has good pitch recognition. This guy was so comfortable in the box. Right? He was probably about the sixth guy on my list. Corey Myers was the 56th guy on my list. Corey Myers hit 20 home runs in batting practice out of 30 pitches. Hank Blaylock was trying to hook shit in the pool right at the, at the Dimeback Stadium. I almost got laughed at for bringing him in the, the stadium. And we took Corey Myers' fourth pick in the country. And it was probably the worst pick ever, right? Because now you got new guys seeing him and they're just putting batting practice into play. And this guy was a professional batting practice guy, right? So in scouting, what are the tools? Hit great, right? If you can hit, bro, you are gonna play. Right? I think power is the most overrated tool in scouting. Because if you can't hit, that your power is not going to play. Right? It's great when you have it, but I think that a lot of kids 
they think they want to have power early. And in my opinion, I think power comes when you're 24, 25, 26, when you get your man body. So if I'm teaching hitters, I want them to be a good hitter. Because the better hitter you become, the more your power plays. Does that make sense? You've got to be a good hitter, man. We've got to use the whole field. Right? So we got the hit grade. You hit, you play. They will find a place for you. Right? But in saying that, you cannot have freaking nine guys that look like freaking uh, freaking just big 230-pound guys that can't play defense. We need defenders, too. This is why Kevin Pillar got his third chance in the big leagues after he hit 200 his first two times, because he can play defense. And if you can play defense, what does that do? It gives you an extra opportunity to have your back catch up. Right? So everybody wants to hit. But I'm telling you right now, if you can't play defense at an average level, minimum, you're not going to stick in the big league. <laughs> right? It's like I said earlier in my talk. I wasn't nervous hitting because I wasn't supposed to get a hit. I was nervous playing defense because if you don't make the plays, bro, you're gone. And in the big leagues, everything is so magnified. Right? Because you got Sports Center, you got baseball tonight, you got all this stuff, and it will be on TV. And if you don't make the plays, it's not good. Right? The arm tool. <laughs> You guys know from talking to me, I am a huge believer in long toss, right? Not hard toss, long toss, and let the kid air it out. I don't need a trainer telling me when my arm's loose, right? I've been, I was with the Blue Jays the last eight years, and we would warm up, and it, it pissed me off that we had these guys on a clock. Okay, three minutes at 90, uh, three minutes at one, uh, 120, and then they give them like two minutes if they want to go back a little bit. And it, when you watch it, and you see the Latin players that can really throw, they get back to the fence as quick as they can get it and throw it nice and high. Because when you throw it nice and high, in my opinion, you're building hand speed, right? You're loosening up everything. And when you come in, it is there, right? So don't limit. I know there needs to be some structure, and I think this is why they did it. Because if you don't do it, not everybody's going to even get out to 120, right? Take your time. If you have to get there 15 minutes earlier to let these kids get their arm and make it a tool, because if, if you don't throw, it's like I said, when you play long toss, in my opinion, you are building bullets. You're not losing them. You don't have so many throws in your arm, in my opinion. Speed. Speed's a tool, right? But you know what speed plays? It plays first to third. It plays in the outfield, right? Because I don't care if you run a 4-1 down the line, a 4-2 down the line, a 4-3, 4-4, 4-5, 4-6, 4-7. You hit a ground ball in the big leagues, you're friggin' out, <laughs> right? But it does play on defense. It does play on base running, right? So you want to have the speed. But the bottom line, is, and I used to get caught up in it because I used to think that if this guy could run and now, dude, and some a college coach told me that, and it made so much sense to me. You hit a ground ball in the big leagues, bro, you're out. So it's a good tool, but it's like it's probably the the, the fifth tool that's important to me now. And it used to be in probably in the 2 3 hole. Because I always felt that I was one step away from the big leagues. Like, I, I can't tell you how many times I was out by one step running down the line. You know, and it was just like I was going to write a book, One Step Away. Um, so you got defense, like I said. You know, and, and when we're talking about defense, you want your ground balls. It's like I said, you want them to expect the ball to be a missile hit to them. You want them to think, I want it to be a missile to hit to me. You think it's side to side, that's where infielders get beat. And we want the short hop and the long hop. See, if, if you bobble the ball at the higher levels, the guy's got to be safe. we got to catch the ball. It's okay for me, like I was playing third base, it's okay to take a drop step and get the good hop. You know, it's like Robin Ventura said. You know, what's your thought process? And, and he said, oh, knock it down and get it over there. But you got to catch the ball. You don't catch the ball, it's not going to happen. So it's okay to take a, a, a drop step back or we got to charge the ball. Because there's no worse feeling than getting that in-between hop in, in baseball. And then, okay, you got to block it. Second baseman, they could get away with it because they got a shorter throw. But if you're playing shortstop and if you're playing third, you better catch the ball. Right? And, and I believe that if a third baseman, a second baseman, and a first baseman is not diving at least every other game, something's wrong. Something's wrong. You've got, you got to be making plays, man. You've got to cover ground. 
right? You have time to catch it, dive, and get up. Shortstop needs to stay on his feet. Because that's probably the furthest throw in baseball. Unless it's an absolute missile where he could dive and get up and throw it, he's got to stay on his feet. So those are the those are the amateur scouting tools. And then I became a pro scout. Well, the second I became an agent. Don't ask me why I did that. But I had I I know why I did it, because I was trying to friggin' buy a house for my family and trying to make guys. See, this is how I made my C D. Right? My C D I, I met a guy named Tommy McCraw, I told you guys. And I made that little tape recorder and it changed my life. So in my mind, when I became an agent, I put some, you should have heard my first CD. You know, it was fastball right down the cock and the car door would be opening. And I gave it to my brother to listen to. And he's like, dude, you clean this up. This is good stuff. And so that got in my mind. I went to a recording studio and I read the whole thing. You can't tell that I've been reading. It's like I'm talking straight to you if you get my CD, right? And I didn't know what I had. And I, I, I bought like about 500 of them. I was just going to pass them out. I gave one to George Horton at Cal State Fullerton. He's at University of Oregon now, and he's a Hall of Fame coach. I gave him one. I didn't know what he did, but I know a week later they played Miami in Miami, the number one team in the country. And he had his whole team listen to my CD five hours before the game. And they, they scored 10 runs three games in a row. He said, Spring, it changed the way that we think. That's when I knew that I had some. Because like what I told you guys before, man, we give ourselves too much credit to remember what we're taught. If you know you make a player better, and you don't get something on audio with that kid when he goes to another program, I'm saying you cheated that kid. Because now he's got to remember everything that you said. Right? I talked to a couple speakers here tonight. I thought their presentations were great. And I told them they just cheated 400 or 40 coaches. And they're like, what are you talking about? I nutted that. I know you did. Now they got to remember it. Right? I think the audio and the video is so important, man. When, when, when somebody, and I'm talking about in life, if you've got a mentor in your work and he makes you better, say, hey, let's, 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 let's talk for 15, 20 minutes about you, what I need to do to be successful at my job. And now you're in the car and you start listening to it. And it makes you, you know, it's like I said, too many people, not only in baseball, but in life, let yesterday beat them up today. And in baseball, I've got a new game, new pitcher, new hero every single night that I play, and I'm going to let yesterday's 0 for 4 mentality or that 1 for 20 play today? It makes no sense. It's like in baseball, if you don't go 1 for 20 friggin' 20 times, you didn't play long enough. Because it's going to happen. In a game where I can do everything right, you go 0 for 4, and then you do nothing right, you go 0 for 4. Guys, I struck out six friggin' times in one day. In, in Pawtucket, doubleheader, I punch out three times. He put me back in the lineup. I got three punch outs. I got two outs. I'm on deck. Guy gets a friggin' hit. I get my seventh at bat. I'm 0 2 quicker than shit, right? I, I'm like 0 2. I'm thinking, oh, this is great. And I get a base hit. And I come in the dugout. I said, nobody strikes me out seven times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe six, but not seven. Right? But we got to be able to laugh at ourselves, man, in baseball. You know, sometimes, sometimes. Like, you'll never hear an analytical guy say, well, that's baseball. There always has to be a reason for everything. You know what? Sometimes that's just baseball. You know, when we're talking about base running, and I believe that that's a tool because I don't believe that you have to be fast to be a good base runner, right? And you got to run around second. What's his job? He wants to score. He wants to get an aggressive lead. He wants to, you know, run. maybe there's one out. Right? Zero outs, yeah, maybe you get through a little bit more. But one out, you want him scoring. And he takes a good secondary, and the hitter hits an absolute missile ground ball back to the pitcher, and the pitcher goes like this and fields it, and he picks the guy off. I don't get pissed at that runner. Some pit, oh, you got to make sure it gets through. Really? I'm trying to score, but yet the pitcher makes the luckiest play, and, and I'm the bad guy? I just think, you know what? Sometimes that's baseball. That's baseball, man. But we got to think that way. And, and it, I, I believe that if, if you could play, you guys have heard me say it all weekend, I think too many players let their mind get in the way of their ability instead of help their ability. So as coaches, we need to help them with their ability. We need to help them get the right guy playing, man. And this is why I love, if you could get your whole team playing, and I don't give a shit mode about me, it's not about you, it's about you helping your team, and you get them playing every single day like it's opening day, because like I said, nobody in the history of baseball has ever walked up the opening dam with no confidence ever. Because there's no yesterday yet. And it's like what I just said, yesterday will kill us if it's a negative. And let me give you another little tip. 
negative people suck. <laughs> Get them out of your life, bro. Right? It's like I just saw that one phrase, before you label yourself with depression, make sure you're not hanging out with assholes. <laughs> that, that bring you down. <laughs> it's such a good statement, man. As a pro scout, I believe pro scout's a little bit easier. Because as an amateur scout, it's amazing how you project this guy and you see him being a big leaguer, and then two years later you scout him in A ball, and he's like a, just a below average player. Right? Pro scouting, they're all pretty good. Right? I thought that I was really, really good at picking out the, the underdog, the sleeper, the Kevin Pillars of the world. And you know why you pick that guy out? Because of that sixth tool. The mind and the heart and the desire and the baseball instincts. Right? If you have baseball instincts and you're a baseball player and you're a great competitor, that plays. You know how many times Dustin Pedroia was told you're too small? You're not fast enough. You don't have any power. Hundreds of times. That didn't affect him, man, because he knew what he was inside. He believed that he was the best player in the world. Right? Do I know I can hit or am I hoping to hit? <laughs> Two completely different players. Right? Clint Hurdle said, well, what did he say? He said something about... Uh, he said, since spring, in his mind, he's the best player. He said, no, he said, sometimes he looks like he's never picked up a bat. But he could friggin' hit. I'm like, I think that was a compliment. <laughs> All right? Dude, I knew I could hit, man. I didn't want to trade abilities with anybody. Uh, I, it's like Billy Bean's quote on my website. If you knew this at 18, instead of learning at 30, people might know who you are. And this is why I teach it, because when I'm talking to a major league all-star or dad of a 10-year-old, I promise you my message is the same. And this is about creating competitors. It's about creating that friggin' guy that you know you want up there in the batter's box. And if your kids are playing with tension, anxiety, and pressure, something's wrong mentally. So we got to give them freedom not to be perfect. We got to give them freedom not to get three hits every single game. But you get friggin' your whole team being competitors and having fun. So like I said, if this game turns into like a three-hour timeout, like they're in trouble, you're playing with the wrong guy. And what's our goal? Our goal is to win the game. <coughs> But yet we got players playing with no confidence. We've got players playing with tension, anxiety, and pressure. It doesn't make sense, man. It doesn't make sense. As a pro scout, a pro scout has the easiest job in baseball, in my opinion. I mean, physically and in, in, in the job. Like coaches in, in pro baseball, scouts make more than coaches, which is so ass backwards it's nuts. Because right? coaches work their ass off. They're there at noon or 1 o'clock. They're doing flips. They're throwing BP. They're hitting fungos. You know what a scout does? He shows up maybe about 4, puts a dip in, watches batting practice, puts another dip in, goes and gets a hot dog, and then, and then watches the game and gives his friggin' opinion. It's the greatest job out there. When I hear a scout complain, I'm like, really, buddy? How'd that friggin' 9 to 5? See how that treats you. Right? I wake up when I want to wake up as a scout. A coach, you're waking up at 5 in the morning during spring training. You're waking up and you're the last guy to leave. I don't know. Pro scouting is really, really good. I roomed at uh, Mike Piazza one day, or one year. I was, in, uh, I was in winter ball. Just had my kid. They released the guy. I was going there for the playoffs. And Mike was nice enough to let me uh, stay with them. He was in double A at the time. I'm telling you, this guy had a plan in double A. This guy knew he could hit. He was hunting speeds. right? You guys heard me talk about approach the whole time. I, 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 I can't, I, it's one of my favorite lines. Is it easier to hit one pitch when you know it's coming or three and you don't? Well, until I get two strikes on me, bro, if I can't grab it, I ain't swinging. And I'm not trying to hit 94 and 79 at the same time. right? I know, I know that we have a really good chance to have a good player if he can hit a breaking ball. Early in, early in his career. Because he's going to see a lot of them once he gets to the big leagues. Because we could all hit a fastball, man. Right? Ted Williams said, he, I, I could time a Lear Jeff, bro. Doesn't matter how hard he throws it. Right? The harder he throws, the slower your feet need to be. Let's talk a little mechanics real quick. Right? Cause I, like I said, I bailed, lunge, and had a bad eye. Remember that Joe Willett story when I was nine? I got hit by Joe Willett. <laughs> I had a little bit of hit. And I believe that you can bail as long as you keep your front shoulder in, right? You can, this is where the bat speed for me is keeping this in. We all talked about torque. We all talked about 
you know, the core, right? And then this, this affects the core. When it leaks too early, you can hit one pitch of middle end fastball, that's it, right? You keep this in, and you're thinking right center. See, for me as a hitter, you could look away and hit in. You can't look in and hit away. Does that make sense? I, it, what, what if I'm sitting fastball and the guy throws a pitch right on the outside black first pitch? Nice pitch, buddy. But two thirds of that plate, if I'm sitting on a fastball, I'm telling you right now, I'm taking a controlled violent swing from my neck to my knees. And I am going to try and drive it. I had over 6,000 at Bass and Pro Baseball. 00, 10, 21, 31. I was trying to hit a bomb. I was trying to hit a home run. You know how many singles I got because of that mindset? Because now I had a more aggressive swing, right? If I'm just trying to slap singles around, I'm not getting no bombs and doubles. You know, I talked about Mark Trumbo a little bit the other day. So like I said, this kid's like my son. We talked three days a week for the last seven years. And last year he shot me a, a no, he, he was talking to me, he's like, Spring, should I just try and slap singles around? Because I don't beat anything out, or should I be content hitting 240 with 30 to 40 home runs? And I said, buddy, unless you want me to change what your quote on my website, I slap singles around. <laughs> I think I think we should probably just stick with the trying to drive balls and, and 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 you know hit bombs and doubles and ribbies and get your get the RBIs. Right? I think you need to know what type of player you are. Every kid needs to know what type of player you are. Like my brother played six years of pro baseball. He's five foot eight. He had this much power, pull power. See, everybody has pull power. Right? On the grading scale, you go 2 to 8. 5 being average, 8 being excellent, 2 being below average. My brother had a little bit of pull power, average power, and he hit like 6 to 8 home runs. Well, I'm telling you, if you have a player that ain't going to hit double digits, I don't want him in any. I want it to be a luck that he was trying to drive a double. But it's knowing what type of player you are. If you got the fast guy, and he's left-handed, you want him hitting the ball. You want him to be like Ichiro. Right? Ichiro's friggin' unbelievable. He's like my favorite player to watch. His discipline to stay inside the baseball and drive stuff to, to the left center is off the chart. Because they say that he has more power than probably 80% of the big leaguers. And if you go watch batting practice and he wants to put some in the seats, it's amazing. But his discipline to be the player that he is is off the chart. Right? Because we all want to be something that we're not. Uh, and so I, I believe that knowing what type of player you are and as coaches helping them know, uh, I believe that's pretty good. My, my pet peeve as a catcher for catchers is when they call a breaking ball, block it, right? In my opinion, a catcher needs to be thinking it's bouncing until it doesn't. It's bouncing until it doesn't. Right? It's one of my biggest pet peeves, that and an outfielder, I told you that the other day, just like half-ass running, hit to, to get the ball, the ball's hitting the gap. And you got a runner on first, and he's going, the guy on third, now he's going third. But if that, that outfielder just friggin' busted as fast as he can, like he's running a 100-yard dash, and then breaking it down about you know 10 feet from him, then getting in and getting a good throw, and hitting the cutoff man. Right? I believe that as infielders, this is why arm strength is important. It was my favorite play, because I had a can. That was my best tool, is I could throw. And I wanted that guy to friggin' go home or to go to third if he hit, if he was a, a hitter. Because I want to friggin' try and hose him out, right? And this is what a, just another tool. If you can throw, you can play a couple different positions. I played third base, I played second base. Everybody's like, what position do you play? You know what I said? I played where the prospect didn't play. If we had a prospect, a young kid that played second base, I played third. Right? If we had a third base, like that was uh, that was Greg Jeffries, right? Because he could play third. No, I played second because he couldn't play second because he played third. And Keith Miller, when he came up there, he was a second base when I played third. The only reason I could do that because I could throw and I could play a couple positions. Right? When I had that great year, my first year, you know, led the league in hits. They tried to make me a shortstop. I wish somebody was smart enough to make me a catcher. Because I was a catcher when I was 11, 12. I was an all-star. And then I didn't grow, and when you don't grow and you're undersized, where do you play? You play second base, <laughs> and that's where I play. But if I would, they would have put me back at shortstop. And another thing about catching, the number one tool you have to have to be a catcher is you better be friggin' tough, man. You better be tough. Because it is like playing friggin' football. 
because I went to instructional league in 1989 with the White Sox because they saw I could throw and I, I was dicking around throwing runners out and they brought me back there and I threw out five guys in a row. My knees hurt so friggin' bad it was sick. I'm like, no, they want to make me a catcher and I'm like, no, 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 no. I want to be able to catch. I don't want to be a catcher. I'm not that tough. <laughs> but you got to be tough. I was in awe three times in my life in baseball. When I first signed, uh, they sent me to Little Falls, New York. Guess who the first round pick of that draft was? Dwight Gooden. I was in left field. They called him up from the rookie ball to pitch for the last three weeks of our season. I was in left field in freaking awe. This guy could have pitched in the big leagues and made the all-star as a 17-year-old. The next year, he goes, he skips low A. They sent him to Lynchburg, which is high A. He struck out 300. You know, you know how we're always into, oh, uh, only 80 pitches or 100 pitches. Dwight Goodness, an 18-year-old, had 10 complete games and punched up 300. You know, th there's no exact science to who's going to get hurt. Right? I mean, the, I mean, bodies are different. Right? You get the, the cleanest mechanics and the guy breaks down. Why? Who knows? I mean, we, we always want to try and, oh, well, this is the reason. Really? I, I, I'm under the impression, you know, when you're scouting, when I would scout a pitcher, I would look at his head. And if it was a free and easy, quiet head, for me, that's a really loose arm. You get the guy that's a head whacker and he's free. And, you know, that guy's a bullpen guy for me. All right? The second time I was in awe is when I got traded to the White Sox in 1988 and Ron Carcavice was catching. This guy came out of his shoe as quick as you could be with an eight arm. It was mind blowing, right? That was the third time I was in awe. The second time I was in awe was when I made the All Star team that first year, and I was coaching first during the All Star game. Go figure. And Vince Coleman was on first base, and he got freaking. He took off five times, and the guy fouled it off, and that was mind blowing. He stole 140 bases that year how quick this guy was. It was that noticeable. Because I was playing second base against him a lot during that season, and if I'm not playing in double play depth with nobody on base, if I was playing back and he hit me a ground ball, he was safe. I played double play depth and get rid of it as quick as I could get rid of it, and it would be a bang-bang play. So, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, you were touching a bit on the the tools and the positions, the profiling, huh? Yeah. Uh, and I was just thinking that maybe at least for a lot of the guys here, it might be good to have an idea of if they have a player, um, at what point do they, how do they balance the idea of, you know, keeping him at the position where maybe he likes it the most or he helps the team the most versus what he might actually have a future at? Yeah, I mean, Profiling is everything. I mean, I believe that if you can play a lot of positions, I believe that's going to give you an extra opportunity to maybe, because you might go to a team where they got the stuff. Like, how would you like to be a, a, a center fielder that the Angels just took? And you got Mike Trout in your way. So if you can move around, I think it's good for you. Uh, but you want to put a kid where he's the best player. Usually the best player at the lower levels is shortstop. It's like what John said, most shortstops, you know, they pitch, they're shortstops, that's where you're going to put your athlete, right? The, 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 with Nowadays, middle infielders are hitting bombs. So you could have an outfielder that's maybe a speed guy or just a good hit tool guy. So it used to be like your corner outfielders are going to hit 30, 25 to 30 home runs. Nowadays, your second baseman might be doing that. So, it, you know, it's all about the grading scale, like I touched on, was, is from 2 to 8, 5 being average, right? There's a lot of guys that have, I'll, I'll, I'll give a guy plus power if I see him go oppo. If I see him go oppo. I'm not giving a guy plus power because he can hit it to left field being right-handed. you got to be able to go oppo. You know how many people have oppo power? Probably about 1% of all players, right? But there's stupid power. Somebody's got to be an 8, right? Somebody's got to have 8. We've got to have a scale for something, right? And I, I believe that... If you can have a bunch of average tools and be a baseball player, you're going to play. You're going to play a long time. You're probably going to play in the big leagues. 
right? You know, if you if you're dropping a, a, a deuce runner, a deuce arm, uh, and now but you you better you better be raking. You know, you better be raking. Does anybody have any questions? Coming back here. Yeah, but the Billy Bean quote sums up what you wish you'd known earlier in your career as a player. But as a coach of coaches, a coach of players, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started out coaching coaches and coaching players? Well, as a coach, I mean, I I believe what I I believe in what I teach. I, I, I as you can tell. I mean, I when when we start talking hitting, I cannot go to anything but the mentality of the player, the competitor of the player. Right. I, I believe that I, I've been the same guy as a coach from day one. We always learn. I pick up stuff this weekend. I get, please always talk baseball, man. I always talk baseball. You're always learning. Right. And, 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 and when I was a player, I learned more from my players probably than my coaches. Like I, Dave Magan was on my team. And this guy would hit 300 every single year. And I asked him, I said, well, what's your thought process? What, what are you thinking up there? What makes you tick? You know what he told me? He said, spring, every at-bat is a new season in my life. And I'm like, really? Every at-bat's the end of my life and you got this friggin' thought process? But it made sense, you know? I mean, I, I, I room with Lenny Dykstra, right? I know he's a whack job now, but this guy was a freaking unbelievable competitor. You know what we did? When me, him, and Billy Bean roomed together, and we, we had a little, our carpet was really good, and we all played golf, and we had a little, uh, a little putting green with a little cup, and we would freaking have competition to see who was buying the pizza. Billy Bean and I, when we roomed together for three years, I promise you we had Domino's pizza every freaking night talking baseball. Talk baseball. I liked rooming with pitchers, because I wanted to know what they were thinking. I roomed with Rick Aguilera, right, who played for the Twins, closer. Right? Get to learn their tendencies. Get to learn what they're thinking. Right? But when you're always talking baseball, you go to these coaches' conventions. Hope I know you guys have learned something. It's like I said. I hope that I've said something that now you guys are going to teach. And now it's your philosophy. I didn't come out of the womb with what I know. I didn't even freaking start in high school. And now I got major league all stars following me. It's mind blowing. And, and this is where we need to talk to our players, man. I mean, break it down one more time. 4'11", 90-pound freshman in high school, 5'8", a buck 40 as a senior. They didn't start. I got cut in college. And now I'm teaching all-star. You're telling me you can't do what you want to do in life? It's about choices, man. It's about making the right choice. It's about treating people right. You treat people right and stuff happens good, man. Call it karma. Call it whatever you want to do. But as coaches, man, it's like I said the other night. I mean, you guys have the biggest impact in one season than anybody else will have in the rest of their life. Am I going to be? Am I going to be a, 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 a one guy said a, an attractor, and or am I going to be a subtractor? <coughs> Abby. Abby. Yeah. Right, uh, dude. I, I could beat you. I could. I could freaking smoke every single person in here with rags. <laughs> it's so easy. Build each other up, man. Build each other up. The game's going to break me down enough. I don't need my coach, my parent, my teammate to do it. The game's going to do it by itself. This is the sport we're playing. It is so easy to be negative. It's so easy to point fingers like John was talking about. Take accountability, man. Have some integrity. Have some freaking, you know. I mean, that, that presentation that he gave the other night, I mean, no wonder they've won two national champions and he's got all these records and stuff. Because it's the culture that he created. And it's like I said, Google Matt Deggs from Sam Houston State. This guy's the freaking man, bro. This guy went to hell and back. He got fired twice and because it was always about him. Not about him anymore. It's about him serving his players. And this player's serving each other. They went to a regional this year. I spoke to his team. It was freaking awesome. You get, you get that good culture going in your program, and I'm telling you right now, you're not only going to change your baseball, but you're going to change lives. You're going to change lives. I want everybody, please get my newsletter on Facebook. Go to Quality at Bats. Sign up for my newsletter. It's free. 
and 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 because we we show out little little stuff every single day. I got a guy named Mark Brooks. He's like my assistant. This guy can steal my identity. He takes all my tweets and turns everything into a Facebook email. And I don't know, man. I I, I believe in what I teach, man. I believe that it's about the mind. I believe it's about compete. I believe that too many players let their mind get in the way of their ability instead of help their ability. Because if you like your abilities and your abilities aren't showing up, I promise you it's not your abilities problem. That's what we're thinking. Anybody else? Fantastic. Good way to end this. All right. Thank you.